Welcome to Prep at Home, the Contractor School, and welcome back to um, our video sessions regarding the NEC 2014. And this is a, a a session or seminar session or webinar session to help you out with the code, the the workbook and the code book. So, going through our workbook is very important because it has a lot of information. Make sure you read all the pages in the workbook. Uh, some of them we have already been touched on here. Um, the introduction, how to get the best grade in your exam, preparation, study recommendations. Some of these we've already went over. Uh, some of the heavy hitters, you know, on test day recommendations, not to get stuck in any one question. Skip the difficult ones. Um, take multiple passes through the exam. We've talked about that. Um, but very important here to uh, make sure we, especially these last two, let me just zoom them up one more time. Don't get stuck in any one question means move through the test, go through it at least three or four times and skip difficult questions that look tough. Okay, just, just skip those. Because you don't have to answer every question to pass the test. But if you go after some of those and they're, and they're tricky, they could really throw you for a loop. Okay, uh, page number six uh, has your formula wheel and your um, tables and article references that you need to tab and highlight. And if you can't find tabs, well, you can get them at most of your local supply houses or you can get them on Amazon for about 10 bucks. But you should have tabs, make you a lot faster for the test. You should highlight all of the article references in our software in your code book after you've turned all your green lights on. Okay. So what I mean by that, if you recall, is <clears throat> if I open up this software here, we'll see where we're at on this one. Uh, and I go ahead and I, I run this, I run this test. You can see this test, this particular test only has five exams, and if, but if I go ahead and run it, and uh, oh boy, this is a plumber's test. Well, that's fine. And I go ahead and uh, take this test. I, I want to read all the way through the exam, okay? And once I read all the way through the exam, and and, and I go back to the beginning and read through it again. Um, uh, so we want to make sure we read through all of the questions. If there's 50 questions or 80 questions or 100 questions in the module, make sure you know what the answer is, what the correct answer is, uh, multiple choice, uh, memorize the correct answer, get all the way to the end. Once you've memorized them all, then you start the test, and then you go ahead and answer the questions. For example, this one's three inches. This one's a, a circuit vent. So you electricians are going to learn a little bit of plumbing here, which is kind of cool, actually. Uh, four inches. Uh, 140 degrees and four inches or larger and number four because what I want you to see is that uh, last question here the flood level right ribs okay so what we want is 100% because we really want to see all your green lights on you guys and if you have 10 tests and you got to pass all 10 of them with a green light uh, if you have eight tests you got to pass all eight with a green light you got to turn them all green on this side before you go and do all your code references is our recommendation okay so going back to um our workbook here our highlighting is to be done after we turn on the green lights okay uh tabbing of course same thing uh you know makes you faster in the code book uh these are all the tables that are very very important to tab uh and then um of course some of these are uh, very important information as well this, this should be tabbed table five table four in chapter nine, table eight, resistance of conductors should be tabbed. Annex C for the same size uh, conductors for conduit fill. That's uh, should be tabbed. And Annex D example should be tabbed. So these are all the places you should tab and highlight at minimum. Okay. And then of course, like I said, if you can go through all the questions and highlight those in your code book, then that's great. Okay. Uh, so to solve for current three phase, power three phase. Uh, knowing that the square root of 3 is 1.732 in decimal, okay, used for all three-phase formulas. Voltage drop equations here. Uh, well, this is to solve for voltage drop, and this one's actually to solve for length given a voltage drop, okay? Maybe we'll go through one of those uh, questions here in a bit, okay? Uh, one horsepower is equal to 746 watts. We've got to know that. And then, of course, uh, this... Um, uh, efficiency uh, and power factor okay sometimes occurs on the exams but definitely resistance of conductors total resistance in series total resistance in parallel for two conductors I mean two resistors 
or three resistors uh, always shows up on the exams. Okay, so we're going to hit each one of those. So let's go for it. Um, uh, this we actually discussed in another in another session, but we'll just go ahead and do it again here Just to make sure we're being thorough here and I'm going to kind of move So if you do need to pause the video, you can definitely do that or if you're on a webinar uh, You know and you're hooked onto our server uh, You can also you know pause the webinar and then continue your study uh, But let's make sure that we get uh, through this workbook so that we can understand where all the math comes from Okay, so if you could, let's go ahead and uh, open up your notepad. I'll open up mine here on the computer, and let's um, make sure that we uh, get on the same page here. Okay, so what we want to do is um, let's go ahead and um, get this in your, in, in your notepad. If we got a 3,000 square foot house, but watch out now because it said 3,000 right of heated space but then there was also 1000 unfinished habitable space for future use so that needs to be added right and then the garage we just ignore okay and we went to a code reference uh, on a, a, a previous uh, seminar that looked up all the code references so we're not gonna do that again but I just want to make sure we got the math down okay so the math in this case wouldn't it be uh, we got our 3000 Okay, and we uh, add the uh, 1,000, and that equals 4,000, okay? Uh, and then we multiply the 4,000, this is square feet, right? We multiply the 4,000 square feet times 3 VA per square foot, square feet cancel, leaving us with 12,000. Now, we got to remember that uh you know this is this is the first step right and this first step is only for your lights okay so uh we still got to add if you recall uh small appliance and laundry so number two here let's go ahead and put small appliance right and the small appliance is actually two circuits uh of 1500 each right so wouldn't it be a total of 3000 okay and then we got lastly the laundry now you guys are getting pretty smart on this because this should be the like eighth video you've uh, or seminar you've been to or eighth hour and we've been going through a lot of this math so I'm gonna move just a little bit quicker right and just make sure we review this should be more of a review because a lot of these questions we've already hit okay so then we go ahead and add this thing up zero zero five and a comma right and then we got five six and a one so sixteen thousand five hundred right so wouldn't we subtract three thousand right leaving us with thirteen thousand five hundred we go ahead and multiply this by thirty five percent which is point zero, uh, I'm sorry, point, uh, point 0.35, okay, is 35%, right? So if we multiply that 13,500, so this is actually the first time we really need our calculator, right? And we can solve these pretty quickly, actually. Uh, so 13,500, right, we multiply by point 0.35, right, that we did have to do with a calculator is not you know uh, easy in the head on that one it could be done but it's better just use your calculator we had four thousand see it disappeared on me uh 725 okay and this is our what we called last time our derated portion right so if this is our derated portion there must be a non-derated portion right which is this one up here this is our non-derated portion, right? So if we get our derated portion and add it back up to our non-derated portion, we add those two together, right? Right. And I'm going to put here add. So if we add those two together, wouldn't it be 7,000? 725 volt amperes okay and so if we go back and look at the question uh, these are very solvable you guys it's just a matter of 
um, going through the math, okay? And I think on the last seminar uh, session, our webinar session, we discussed that the, the Annex D is very important. Annex D 1A is your standard method uh, for, uh, for these service loads. And then example D2A is your optional method. And you really should go over those on your own time. Okay, we're not going to go through them again on this video. It's a matter of understanding. Do you understand where that math came from? That you simply add it up, subtract 10,000 off the net. So we got a total here, 29,000. We subtract 10,000, give us 19,000. We take the 19,000 times 40%, giving us the 7880, right? And uh, then we add it back to the 10,000, okay, giving us the 17, and then we add our heater, okay? Whereas with here, on your standard method of calculation, once again, we get our general lighting, small appliance, and laundry, which are required circuits, add them up for 9,000, subtract 3,000, giving us 6,000, multiply that 6,000 by 35%, giving us 2,100, and if we add that 2,100 back to our original uh, non degraded portion of 3,000, then we get 5,100. Now that's our net for general lighting, small appliance, and laundry. Then we do our range based on the table, dryer, and anything else. That's the standard method. Notice it's broken up here where you do that group first, then the rest of the stuff using the tables. And here you group everything and just use math. Okay, so that's why we say that optional is a little bit easier. Okay. So uh, we talked about this one um, in another session, but let's go ahead and hit it again here, uh, just in case uh, you missed it. Uh, and we want to make sure that we got the math. So uh, let's get a new piece of paper uh, in your notepad, because it's talking about ranges, OK? And let's make sure we just rip through here. And like I said, uh, I'll probably go through it a little bit faster, because we've already, this will be the second time we've seen it, OK? So let me just go ahead and add a page here. And we'll just see how we do this one in our notes. Okay. So if you got your range, right, and the range is 20,800 watts, okay, then that's the same as saying 20.8 kW. And we know that column C, right, in table. Uh, 220 55 is only good up to 12 kW well if that's the case then we got to take the difference of these two numbers so we subtract them leaving us with 8.8 .8 kW okay this 8.8 .8 times 5% or 0 0.05 leaves us with 0.44 or 44 percent so now it's 44% of my of my uh, of, of my table value. Now, the my table value for one range. This is this is just one range, right? So since it's one range, let's take a look at this. Uh, let's go ahead and go to that in our code book here. So we're going to table, and this shows up a lot. So we need to make sure we got this one here. Let's make sure you follow along, because this one for sure is on the exam. You know, four or five times. We got to make sure we got it. Okay, so that's why we're going back. A lot of guys, well, let's go back to that one. Let's review. And so that's what we're doing here. One range, right, whether it be 9,000, 10,000, 11,000, or 12,000, is the value of what? 8,000, right? 8,000 watts. 8,000 watts, right? That's what that's what's highlighted right there, 8,000 watts. So in our notepad, this is, this is 44% of 8,000, right, which is the value for one range in column C, okay? So 44% times 8,000, now that I can't do in my head, but let's go ahead and pull up our calculator. We get a basic calculator, that's all we need. This is be kind of like what you get on the test, okay? Just one of these basic calculators, 8,000 times 0.44, and we get 3520, okay? Now that 3520, let's go and write it down. That 3520 volt amperes, this is what we call our, once again, derated portion. Okay. Now, the portion that we didn't derate was the column C value, right? So don't we need to still add that back in there? Right. 
and we get 11,520 volt amps, which is very, very close to the answer that you'll probably see if you see this question, 11.6 kW. And that would be the correct answer. Okay, so that's how to solve that one. It's a range that's too big. Uh, here um, we got a range that's also too big, uh, but I think there's another problem, right? There's 32 of them. Okay, so let's go ahead and knock this one out. If we look at the table, uh, 18 is bigger than 12, so that's an issue, and 32 is way down here, so that's a problem. So we've got a couple of problems. Okay, number one, let's start with the problem number one. Problem number one is that we got too many units, there's not one unit, it's 30. 32 units. Okay, so if it's 32 units, wouldn't it be 32? Right, it falls right in here, and if it falls right in there, then it'd be 32. It'd be 15 plus one for every one kW for every range. So it would be 15 plus 32. Right? You see where the 32 come from? So 15 plus 32. So in our notes, I, I need another sheet of paper here. Let's go ahead and put this one in our notes, <clears throat> and clear this thing out here. If we have uh, 32 ranges, right, and uh, they're each 18,000 watts, well, how do we solve it? Okay, well, we saw that the code reference said that for the ranges, it would be 15 plus the 32, right? So that would be equal to 47. Uh, oops, uh, messed that up. Let's see if I can squeeze the 7 in there. Oh, okay, 47kW, right? 47kW. So this is now our new <clears throat> column C value, our new. Well, because it's not really in there, right? We're, it's, we're superimposing it in this spot. Because that's the value, like here it's 40, you know, here it's in the 30s, right? Down here it's in the teens and so forth. Well, th so the, the new value right there it, for us, for this application, is 47. Okay? So since that's the case, we just rock and roll the math. It's really not that bad. Uh, we go back and say, okay, if that's my column C value, right, uh, 47 kilowatts, okay, we, we, we need that, but remember, we need to get this issue resolved regarding it being larger than 12 kW because remember, as we talked in another session uh, of this webinar, seminar, is that uh, for every kW above 12, we need to increase by 5%. That's what it says right there, right? Column C shall be increased by 5% for every kW above 12. Well, since that's what it says right there, that it's going to be increased by 5% for every kW above 12, then wouldn't the math simply be um, are the size of the range, right, which is 18, it would be 18,000, right, minus 12,000, right, the value of the range, this is the value of the range, this is the value of column C, right, we subtract the two and we get 6 kW. Right, our 6kW times 5%, 5% as we talked about before is 0 0.05. Right, so 6 times 5% is 0 0.3, or 30%. Okay, well 30% of what? Remember, it's 30% of that number. Okay, so 30% of 47. Now that one we can't do in our head, right? So let's pull up the calculator, and we get 0.3 times 47, and we get 14.1. 14.1 what? Kilowatts. Well, when this 14.1 kilowatts, right, which is our derated portion, is added back up to our non-derated portion, when we add these two together, don't we come up with the correct answer, 61.1 kW? And that is how to solve that one. Okay, 61.1 kW. Let's see if we got it right. Okay, boom. That's the correct answer right there. Okay, so that's um, it on...
ranges. I think that explained it pretty well. There's another, uh, and we should take a note on this at least, um, example in your annex, um, annex D, example 6 is for multiple ranges. Make sure you read and study that annex. Okay, that is homework. Okay, you need to find it, read it. It should make sense. The math is similar to what I just showed you. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on here. Um, given a service ha a conductor of 250, let me see if I can minimize this. If I can, that'd be great. Okay, given, <clears throat> get a little bit bigger if I can. Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, I think you could probably see that now. Given a service has conductors at 250 kcm of copper with a driven ground rod as its only means of grounding, what copper grounding electrode conductor would be required? Interesting. Okay, now, uh, so the what you got to be careful with is to make sure that you got you understand we're going from copper to copper okay so just double check that copper to copper makes it easy that's not too hard to to remember and i think we can get the, this thing right so we want to go here in our code book now table 25066 so let's all go ahead and turn there together in the code book 25066 and i guarantee you'll need this four or five times, hopefully. Hopefully you need it 10 times because it's so ridiculously easy that if you can't use this table, you should probably be fired from your job, right? It's too easy. Uh, this one is uh, ridiculously easy. When we see these ones, we say, praise the Lord, okay? Because this is easy stuff. Just got to read the question carefully. In this case, the service is 250 KC mil. If the service is 250 KC mil, we fall into play right here where it says through. Because we want the copper column, not aluminum, copper column, right, for the service. And you should highlight service. It's the service, not the overcurrent protection. That's a different table. This is the service that dictates your electrode conductor. So you should highlight those two words. Service entrance dictates your electrode conductor, okay? And 250 would fall in right there on the copper column. Then we go to the copper column for your electrode conductor, and you see a number two. So this would be the correct answer there, number two. Okay, so let's just see how we did here. Uh, so it should be that one right there. Multiple choice number two, correct choice two og. Okay, let's go to the next question. According to the NEC, what uh, size copper uh, grounding electroconductor, so same table, okay, would be required for a service built with 380. Okay, so the thing is, is if we know that it's going to be a 380 amps, we don't know the size of the wire. What we know is the impacity, right? We know the impacity. And we talked about impacity on a previous session. And in the previous session, we, we went through it very thorough. If we, if we have the impacity of the wire and we have the insulation of the wire, we can figure out what size it needs to be. And that's using this table here, 31015. B16. Now that one I guarantee is on the test. So let's make sure we uh, can jump there quickly. This shouldn't be a problem. We have a tab. We're good to go. And we look up 380. Now carefully make sure you read what insulation we're talking about. THHN. And we talked about the THHN and making sure you highlight it here. Okay. And you go down to 380. If you go down to 380, I don't see 380. No, I do see 380. Right there it is. Right, and we follow it on over, and we see 400 kc mil. Okay, remember that you stay on the copper side. Don't use aluminum too much. If you do, you're probably going to make some mistakes. Okay, you got to stay on the copper side. So a gentle X on this side might make sense. THHN column once again. Double check 380, and it's 400 kc mil. Okay, so if that's the case, and I know that I got a 400 kc mil, and I think that's what we got in our notes here, then can't we take that to size over here to table uh, 25066? Table 256 gives us the size of the 
uh, ground electric conductor, but we needed the size of the service first. Okay, so let's go ahead and go now to the table to get the answer that we need. Okay, and you guys just flip back there if you could. That would be great. <clears throat> Uh, right here, and we we just looked up that we needed a 400. Wasn't that correct? We needed a 400, okay, service. So if we need a 400 service uh, that's copper, wouldn't it fall in right here? Sure. Over 350 through 300, our 400 would fall in there. And if we're going copper ground electric conductor, it would be a one aught, right? Staying in the copper column, it would be a one aught, okay? So um, that's the correct that's that's the correct answer for that one one aught okay for the grounding electroconductor very easy tables to use these are the tables that you you should use on your second pass through the examination okay uh, so moving on to a different table similar type table but instead of 25066 which is where we're at here we we'll want to go to 122. Okay, now we we're here as well in a previous session of the seminar, and this is for uh, equipment. Equipment, I'd like for you to highlight that word right there equipment grounding conductors. Okay, and the equipment grounding conductors uh, are uh, very easy to size, but they're not based on the service entrance, right? They're based on what? Overcurrent device, right? The breaker size, the diffuse size determines your bonding jumper. That's the other word for this is bonding jumper. So if I know my overcurrent device, I can size my uh, equipment ground. If I know if it's copper or aluminum, I get the proper column. Usually copper, usually copper, okay? In this case, it says it's a copper bonding jumper. That's their terminology sometimes. Uh, if the overcurrent protective device is 15 amperes, Okay, so if it is 15 amps, that falls in right here. Okay, and the corrective copper equipment grounding conductor would be a number 14, which of course nobody has in their truck, right? So that's the answer. Okay, very typical for them to do that stuff. Choose something that you wouldn't guess. Number 14 is the correct answer. Okay, right there. Next question. Um, in a residential dwelling, direct bird cables that are GFCI protected at 20 amps must be installed in how many inches below grade? Okay, good question. Um, that's table 300.5. A lot of these are review, you guys, so I'm, I'm moving through them kind of quick. Uh, if you do need to review the other seminar uh, sessions, please do so. Uh, or if you need to put this thing on, on slow down or pause, you can definitely do that as well. Okay, but a GFCI is listed over here in column four, okay? And the GFCI is listed right there. And we go down to the proper row, and it was talking about a dwelling, didn't it? I thought it said dwelling. So this is public stuff here. Parking lots, driveways, highways, that's all public. But this one here is, guess what, dwelling, right? And if I go all the way over here to the proper column, I was in column four, I see a 12 right there. I see a 12 right there. Okay, so that's the correct answer to this one, 12 inches. Okay, multiple choice number two. Next question, uh, going back to impacities of wire. Um, so what is the impacity of three? Now oh, that's a good one. Of three number one THW conductors at 86 degrees, okay? Well, Three of them. Oh, well, let's guess that's a pretty easy question, right? Because my table, 310, uh, 15, uh, 16, that's where I want to start. 310, 15, B16. Let's go back to there uh, to make sure we pick this up. <clears throat> uh, 310. I'm going to spell it or something here. Okay, so table 31015B16 uh, is the proper table for impassives conductors. And the question says that we got three number one THWs. So once again, this is a THHN, you should highlight that. In the third column, you should highlight the THW in the second column. I'm pointing to it here on the board. 
And then down here, write in the word NM over here where, by the UF, write in NM because that's what they're going to ask you is non-metallic sheath cable. And that is that column. Okay. Now, this particular question said THW, number one. So a THW, number one, right? Highlight that. I come on down to a number one. I see 130 amps. If I just follow this across, I run into my 130. Okay. The number one row and the THW column, I run into 130 amps. So when I have my 130 amps, I need to write that down, right? Because, uh, well, in this case, it's actually the end of the end. It's at the end of the question because, see, this the, this question that says that there's three of them grouped together. Well, this this table is good for not more than three, not more than three. So up to three, we're good. This is the opacity. 130 amps is the correct answer. The other reason that it is the correct answer is that the question says, so there's no derating for the number of conductors, but the question says it's 86 degrees Fahrenheit in the raceway. Well, if we back up a table, no, we back up two tables, not this big table here, but this little one here. And, uh, this is 31015B2A, okay? And that's on your page 158. But this table, 310B2A, is your ambient temperature correction factors. And notice that 86 degrees over here on the right has a multiplier, right? A multiplier allowance, right, of one. <laughs> so any number times itself, right, any number times one is still the same number. So when we came up with the 130 amps over here, right, when we came up with the 130 amps uh, from table 31015 and multiply it by one, we still get 130 amps. So that's the easy answer to that one. Okay. Um, now, it is very important that when you have multiple conductors like this next question that you know how to solve it because this typically is what's going to show up on the exam is multiple conductors more than three in that in this case there's four and at a hot temperature which means they'll be derating for that temperature so let's go ahead and put this one in our notes okay let's uh, just uh, get ourselves a new page if we must okay and get, let's get this in our notes uh, so on this one, what we want to do is, um, the the first thing is, um, get my view correct, it's the first thing, right, is we get um, from table 310.15.B.16, right, for our uh, number, what do we got here? Number one THW is the same stuff, okay? So number one THW, we get 130 amps. We looked that up like three times now, okay? That's not a problem. But the problem with this question comes in because there's four conductors. Now, since there's four conductors, and you see up here at the top of the table, and once again, the 130 amps comes from right there, right? Matching up the THW with the number one, you get the 130 amps. But this says not more than three. So since there's four, you got to back up a page and get your derating because there's four conductors ran together. So four conductors ran together is a multiplier of 0.8. Right? See that there, 0.8 or 80%. So in your notes, wouldn't we get our 130 amps and multiply that by 0.8 for uh, the number of conductors? That's where that 0.8 comes from. Okay. Now, the last thing is looking at the question is that it's too hot. 130 degrees, 132 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, in our code book, if we back up just one more page, nope, we've got to go back two pages in my case. There's a small table for temperature that's the correct table for conductors, correction factors based on 86 degrees Fahrenheit. This one was 132, okay? So the F's on this side for Fahrenheit and the C's on this side for Celsius, okay? So I slide down this column for Fahrenheit down to I see 132 and slide on over to the proper column. Now the proper column 
is sometimes confused because the proper column is based on these temperatures. So the center column is the one I need in this case, so it'd be 0.58. The center column, you should put a header, if you don't already have it up here, and put that little note that it's for THW, right in this area somewhere, put the acronym THW. And then to the right of it, where you see the 90 degrees Celsius, put THHN. And on the far left column for 60 degrees Celsius, put NM, Nancy Mary. Okay, but we need this 0.58, right, because this is the 132. Matches up with the column that we need for THW, and we see the 0.58, okay? So back on our notes, we just multiply this 0.8 by 0.58 and multiply all this stuff together, right? So just get our calculator out, 130 times 0.8 times 0.58, and we get... 60 amps okay and if we go to the question this one should be a done deal correct answer is multiple choice number one okay next question uh, what is the size of the secondary current uh, of a 75 thousand volt amp transformer given a three phase 480 volt primary and a three phase 120 volt secondary interesting okay so we would want to use the secondary side right the 28 that's the that's the full voltage and here the 75,000 is the full power right so power divided by voltage gives us what ampacity so surely we remember here uh, but let's go up and double check if we don't that wouldn't it be I is equal to P divided by E. This one, we just beat the heck out of this one, if I recall, in other seminars, uh, sessions. But let's go ahead and put it in our notes anyway. 75,000, in this case, divided by 240. Now, since it's three-phase, we got a little issue there. And let's make sure we can get it, right? It Wouldn't it be I? Uh, and then we got our P here. And then we got an E over here. And that spells pi, right? Because we love pi here at the school. Right, and so if I if I'm looking for I and I cover it right with my thumb, rule of thumbs to cover I, you got P which is 75,000, and you divide it by E, which is 208, right? Full power divided by the full voltage, watts, volts, and then don't forget that you got to multiply this bottom by 1.732. Why? Because it's a three-phase problem. Okay, so if we were to put all that in our calculator. I'll move it to this side. Wouldn't it be 75,000 divided by 28 divided by 1.732? And we get the correct answer, 208 amps. OK. So that would be how we solve that one. OK. And the correct answer would be number 228 amps. OK. Uh, so just be careful with that one uh, when you have the square root of 3. Uh, same equation here, except in this case we have uh, 54,000 for the power, same 208, and still 3 phase. So let's just pull up our calculator straight away. We're already getting really good at this, right? Wouldn't it simply be 50,000 divided by 208 divided by 1.732? And you get 138. Now, uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, let me clear that out because that didn't come out right. Uh, 54,000 divided by 208 divided by 1.732. I probably didn't put the digits in right. Okay, so 149 is correct. And that's what I'm showing here on the screen. So we, when we get the 149, the, the, the question is not simply the impacity, even though that would be the impacity, right? The question is not impacity. The question is, what would be the minimum THW copper conductor? So we're looking for the service size. So anytime you're looking for service size, feeders, or branch circuit conductors, we got to use table 31015B16, right? And let's see if our code book's still there. On my version, if not, maybe uh, you could just flip there real quick. We just got to uh, get up there, right? And 
the question said that <clears throat> they're to be teach W. And we need to look up 150 amps, right? 149. So if we look up THW, which is the center column for copper, and we slide down to 150 or 149, the, the, the next one bigger than 149 is 150, which is a one aught. Okay? So the correct answer in this case would be multiple choice number two, one aught. Okay? Excellent. Okay, so next question, number 12 here, what would be the full load current rating of a single phase 115 volt half horsepower motor? Some of the stuff is so easy, um, but it should, th it, I'll be honest with you, and I think I put a note in here somewhere, is that, you know, the, the stuff in the workbook, by the time you go take your exam, should be easy. And if it's not, you're probably not ready for the exam. Okay, this this stuff in the workbook is one electricity 101 stuff, and you really should be able to do it. So 115 volts columns, the first thing we need to get, right, is is uh, first thing we need is, is this column right here, 115. Once we get that the column correct, we match it up with the horsepower on the far left, and it lines up with 9.8, 9.8. Amps, right? Full load current. Okay, and that's our single phase table. And then, of course, on the next page is our three phase table, and we've already highlighted these, right? Three phases: uh, the uh, table 43250 and table 43248 is our single phase. You should have already had those highlighted. Okay. Uh, next question here. Uh, this is kind of a good one, actually, because it, it brings up a concept that we need to make sure we understand. Um, so let me hide the answer here, right? Uh, what is the, what size THW copper conductors required for continuous duty? Uh-oh, continuous duty should mean something to us. 208 volt, 30 horsepower motor with a nameplate rating of 74 amps. Well, a lot of guys are going to get the 74 amps. Multiply it by 125% since continuous duty and then go size their wire. But that would be wrong because the uh, the conductors, right here it says, just says conductors, it doesn't say branch circuit conductors or feeders, but the conductors, which are the wires, are not based on the, um, the nameplate rating. The conductors are not, are not based on the nameplate rating. The conductors... Branch conductors or feeders are based on what? The tables. The tables, right? So we need to go to the tables. 408, 30 horsepower, and look that up. So three phase. Uh, and we've got to look up the voltage. 208. So that would be this column here. Okay. And then we go down to the correct horsepower on the far left. And the horsepower said it was 30 horse. So wouldn't we line up the 208 column? Right, and then we'd slide down, and then we'd go all the way to the 30 horse, which is down here, and we come across and see the point. Uh, I'm sorry, the 88 amps full load current. Okay, now the 88 amps, we need to write that down. So let's go ahead and put this one in our notes if we can. Uh, we're talking about a uh, uh, 208 volt, 30 horsepower. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and open up a notepad. Uh, a motor operating on 208 volts, 30 horsepower. You should be taking this note here, or you could write it right there in your workbook. That gives us 88 amps. But we've got to multiply by 1.25 which is, I would say, the minimum in most cases, unless it's a unique case. That's the minimum for sizing. Write that in there. For sizing your uh, conductors. Okay? That is a very important issue. If you forget it, you're going to miss some problems. Okay? You've got to do this multiplier here for a motor. You can't just size based on the 88. You're going to get it wrong. Okay, so just wake up here. 88 times 1.25 gives us 110. Okay, so now 110 amps. Now that would be the, the opacity that we would take on over to table uh, 310.15, right? 
that would be the opacity that we would take over. And I think the question said THW. So let's just double check on that. And it did. So let's go ahead and put THW uh, over here somewhere. THW and the size is what we're going to answer right now. So if we if we open up the code book and we go back to 31015. Okay, so uh, I'm close. Oh, okay, so here it is. And we look up THW, which is right here. And we slide down to 110 amps, which is 115, right? Would be the next size up. We go to 115 and over to the left, we'll see a 2 aught. I'm, I'm sorry, a 2 aug. 2 aug. <clears throat> so the correct answer would be number 2. Multiple choice number 1. OK, now uh, just to make sure that we got it. OK, what part of the motor circuit is sized according to the current rating marked on the motor nameplate? OK, so let's make sure we understand this. We got to get this one down now. What part of the motor circuit is sized according to the current rating marked on the motor nameplate? Well, that's the overload. The correct answer is overload on that one. OK, and there's actually a section in here where we could highlight our, our, our book in this case. So let's see if we could find it, and I'll try to help you uh, highlight your book a little bit here. Now, 436. This right here, 430.6. And there it is. So 430.6, and down here, uh, the tables. Determine the opacity of the conductors. Highlight that. So it's the tables that determine the opacity of the conductors. I'm going to stop there. I'm on 430.6 A1. For those of you who are falling asleep here, we got to we got to we got to wake up here, pay attention, and do our highlighting here so that we can understand and we don't forget this thing. The conductors are based on the Opacity from the tables, not the nameplate. I'm going to blow this up. Make sure you've highlighted it. <clears throat> Actually, I guess I should highlight all of these, right? All of these tables. Okay, because we want to include 248, which is single phase, and 250, which is our three phase. Okay. Now, if we slide down a bit, that was one. But down here under 2, if I recall, under 2, it's the nameplate that determines what? The overload. And that maybe you could just want to write, a, write like an arrow. Put like an arrow here. It's the nameplate that dictates your overcurrent protection. And that should kind of make sense. So, for example, let's say that I'm just going to use my notepad here to kind of explain this issue. Uh, let's say, for example, I have a breaker box here. Okay, and I have all these breakers in this particular panel. And then I got some wire, right? And I got a motor over here. Okay, these conductors, these conductors right here, use the tables to size. Okay, they use the tables, right? So for, so for the conductors, use the tables and that should kind of make sense um, but the overcurrent protection over here let's put OC the overcurrent protection is based on what let's draw a little arrow here uh, coming through here and I got off screen here apologize right so the um, boy, this uh, computer went crazy on me here. I apologize. So I'm going to draw this arrow. And the, though that is the, the nameplate. If there's a nameplate here on the motor, right, that's nameplate. So that's, uh, we can write that in there, I suppose. Right, 
This is the nameplate. The nameplate is what dictates the overcurrent protection. Okay, it's the it's the tables that dictate the conductors, and it's the nameplate that dictates the overcurrent protection. And I think that would kind of make sense if you're in the field, right? And you go over here and you check out this motor or this spa motor in the pump, and you walk back to the breaker box. You should be able to, without the code book, say, okay, my nameplate says, you know, 16 amps. So when I walk over here to my overcurrent protection, it better be a 20 amp breaker. That should kind of make sense, right? The nameplate dictates the overcurrent protection, and it's the tables that dictate the conductors, okay? So let's go back and take a look at the question real quick and <clears throat> see if we got that thing right. We highlighted our book already, okay? And... I think that kind of finishes this one up, right? It's the nameplate that dictates the overload. And on the previous question, uh, not seeing now. Maybe it's on this question. Okay. Uh, question number 15, it's the tables that dictate the branch circuit conductors. Okay. So that's how to answer uh, those two questions. Okay. So let's go ahead and go on and we'll go on to the next question. Okay. So... The next question here, number 16, given a circuit serves 10 horsepower, 208 volt, three phase scroll cage, whoa, design B motor with the nameplate rating of 37 amps, what's the maximum oper operational setting of the adjustable inverse time circuit breaker? Okay, so now it's going to get interesting, right? Do we use the tables? Do we use the tables or do we use the nameplate? Well, we just talked about it, right? The 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 if we're talking about the breaker, and isn't that what it's talking about? The breaker, the overcurrent protection. We still have it on the screen here. It's kind of ugly, right? So maybe I should draw it a little bit better. But the breaker sizes over here are dictated by the nameplate over here. Okay. So back to the question: um, Do we use the horsepower and the voltage? Three phase, all this stuff? No. No, if the nameplate is 37, that's what dictates the breaker size. Okay, so we got to watch that. Otherwise, we're going to get messed up. We got to understand the theory of how to size the motors. Otherwise, we think we got it right. It's one of the answers, but it's wrong. You know, uh, we got to make sure we get the theory right. Okay, so uh, on this case, it would simply be our 37 amps times 250. Why, why 250? Why 250%? Well, there's a table for that. Let's make sure we highlight it in this particular uh, session of the seminar. Um, table uh, 43052, uh, always on the exam. It's not on the exam that much, okay? But we surely wouldn't, wouldn't want to miss it, okay? So let's go there and make sure we highlight it and we're ready for it, okay? Uh, Why did this do that? Go up, Go up, back up there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this table uh, shown here on the screen, it said that the, 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 the question said that it was an inverse time circuit breaker, right? Inverse time circuit breaker. So in this table, inverse time circuit breaker is over here on the right. Inverse time circuit breaker, right? Right there on the right. And you can see all the multipliers are in percent, right? We've highlighted that before. They're in percent here, and so 250% is 2.5, right? So in our math, wouldn't it simply be, you know, I'm going to have to clear this thing out here. It got way too full. Uh, add a page. <clears throat> Get so we can both see each other. And wouldn't it be our 37M? So we got our nameplate. Our nameplate of... 37 amps, right? And then uh, we multiply by uh, 2.5, which is 250%, right? which comes from that table. Let's make sure we got that number right here. 43052. 43052, right? And that was for our inverse time circuit breaker. And if we multiply those two out, then our 37 amps times our 2.5 is equal to 92 and a half. So that's equal to 
92.5 amps. Okay, now what's the next step we got to do? Well, the question said, what's the maximum operating setting, uh, setting of the inverse time circuit breaker? Well, uh, boy, that's not a very good question uh, because there is that's not a standard value. Okay, that's where this one ends, but that's kind of weird. Okay, uh, it really shouldn't end there. It should be a standard rating, and we all know that's going to be 100 amp, right? And that's going to be let's double check we know this. Where would we find this at? The standard rating of fuses. Where do we find the standard rating for fuses? If you've been studying, if you've been listening to the seminar or lectures, we should know it's 240.5. Six, right? So let's go ahead and back up there. <clears throat> Make sure we got this thing highlighted. And there's our standard ampere ratings. And 92 is not one of them, but what is? 100. Okay. That would be a better answer, right, to this particular question. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, this is voltage drop. Okay. With our voltage drop, you need this formula. And this formula is listed on page six of your workbook. Okay. Uh, so, you know, just back up a few pages, you'll see that that's where it's written. And you need to have this written in your code book somewhere. Uh, most people choose like an obscure page in the back, just in case they need to rip it out. Um, but, you know, you have to have some of these formulas written somewhere because, boy, without the formula, this is what we call our magic formula for voltage drop. But without this magic formula, it's going to be difficult to solve this one. OK, so um, but it's real easy with the formula. OK, so in this case, let's go and get our calculator out. And we'll just knock this thing out. It's pretty easy, like I said, with the formula. Uh, so let me clear this. The square root of three, the square root of three we've talked about before. That's one point seven three two. And the reason we use the one point seven three two is because it is a three phase problem. OK, and that's what it says right here. It's three phase. So we need that 1.732. Then we multiply times the value for Kelvin, which is also on page six of your workbook there. That's 12.9. So times 12.9, right? We multiply by 150 feet, which is the length from the uh, load to the source. So times 150. Times. 21 amps, where does that come from? Uh oh, uh oh, 21 amps. Well, I don't see it up here. So it must come from this, right? And we're gonna leave that as homework. Wouldn't it come from the 480 volt column of the three phase motor table for a 15 horsepower motor? Yes, it would. Okay, so that's where we, we should have went and gotten that one first, right? And I think that's what the, the, this says here. Go get your 50, your 21 amps here first, okay? But we're going to go ahead and continue uh, with the equation here because uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to divide by the circular mills. Now, the circular mills, you can see, is 26,240. 26,240. Well, how do we know that? Well, we know that because we remember that in Chapter 9, Table 8, which is called Conductor Property. So if I uh, search for Conductor Properties here, that's the title uh, of the table, Conductor Properties. Um, and we look up the size of this wire, in this case said it was a uh, 6 aug. So we go down to 6 aug and we find 6 aug right here and the number... Uh, for the KC mills, I'll zoom in a little bit here, is 26,240, right? This is the circular mills for number 6 aug, 26,240. So that's where all that comes from, okay? So on our calculator, all we got to do is, do, this is a funky number, right? But it, once we get that number, uh, let's just make sure we put them all in there, okay? We had 1.732. Ah, 1.732 times 12.9 times 150 times 21 amps, right, for our uh, FLC of the 15 horsepower 480 volt motor. And we hit the equal sign, 
that number looks a little bit more reasonable uh, because then we need to divide by that number we looked up in the back, the 26,240, divide by 26,240, and we get the correct answer 2.68 or 2.67, which is the number they got, volts. Okay, so you know these ones are a little bit tricky. Uh, if you can't remember how to do it, just do the best you can to remember. 2.67, 2.67 volts is an answer to a state test question, okay? One that has appeared in the past. This one here, same situation, right? Voltage drop, I'm gonna go and let you solve that one on your own. Um, it's a very similar formula. We just uh, manipulate the formula some, right? So let's put this in our notepad. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and put this one in our notepad. If we got <clears throat> the voltage drop, is equal to the square root of 3 times k times the length times the impacity divided by the circular mills. And, um, you know, what, what, what we're looking for is length. We could modify this formula, okay? If we uh, modify the formula, then we're going to say, okay, let me divide, let me multiply both sides by circular mills. Okay, uh, the circular mills from this side will cancel. Okay, and then we also need to divide both sides by impacity. So if these cancel, we divide both sides by Kelvin. So if these ones cancel, okay, and we divide both sides by the square root of 3. So if these ones cancel. Now I know that looks a little bit ugly, but that's what, <laughs> but that's how we'd get L by itself to solve for L, and that's why I told you in your in your in your workbook, uh, if you go up to uh, page six, you're going to find this equation: voltage drop times the circular mills divided by all this stuff in the denominator two times Kelvin times I. Now keep in mind that that two comes from the fact that this particular question is single phase, okay? And there it says right there, single phase. And if it's the square root of three, then it's because it's a three-phase problem. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that one for you to work on. If you can't figure it out, call me or text me. I'll show you how to do that one. Uh, but the math is given here. I think you can handle that one. You have it in writing there. Uh, this one we solved on another video, uh, but it's quite simple if we use Annex C. So let's go ahead and Annex C and knock this one out. Uh, we're actually close, right? Let's go to Annex C here in the back of the book. You can see how simple this one is to solve, assuming you can find the table, right? And you have it tabbed. And we go down to schedule, I think this was schedule 80. Uh, it is, no, nope, schedule 40, okay? So if it's schedule 40, um, then let's go ahead and solve this one. Uh, schedule 40, PVC. So schedule 40 is right here, C10. Okay, for rigid PVC conduit schedule 40. Okay, now that's on page 827. So let's hop over there, page 827. And um, so I think I'm there. Let me zoom out a little bit here. It is. So it's page 827. And then we got to find um, uh, the type of conductor. In this case, it's THW that we're going to put in there. So if you find THW on the far left, I see some THWs, but these aren't big enough. Right, okay, there they're starting to get bigger. Okay, because what I need, according to the question, was 400 KC mills. 400 KC mills. So if I go down THW here, oh, that's not it. Uh, where'd it go? Okay, back to the top. THW is what we're looking for here on C10. THW. This teach oh there it is right there okay so I apologize let me get this a little bit bigger I apologize uh, teach W once again we're on uh, table C10 which is schedule 40 so we're good so take your time here double check right teach W and then we slide down to 400 right and then we come across to so we see there's three there's four that one won't handle it this one will that's six and we slide up here 
and it corresponds to a three and a half. Okay, and that's how to solve that one. So uh, let's see what else we got on here. Um, we got some box fill. Those we covered in detail on a previous seminar. Matter of fact, it was the last seminar, so I don't think we really need that one because you did it just probably an hour ago. And then this one was on solving for cubic inches, so we will do this one. Uh, this one here on box fill, let's leave it here for a second so you can read it. I'll read it to you. Number 20, a conductor enters a pool box with two-inch conduit on the east side. The conductor then makes a U-turn and enters out at two and a half on the same side. What's the minimum distance from the east to the west? And we solved for 17 inches before. Okay, so you should already have that one in your notes. And if uh, you don't, then you're more than welcome to call the school, speak to any of the engineers, okay? Uh, number 21. Uh, this one here, let me blow this thing up a little bit here, uh, because this one has multiple conductors in a box. So let's make sure we get this one in our, in our, in our notes. We've got six number 14s, so let's put that in there. Uh, six number 14s, and uh, let me, pull, let me uh, bring this down here. And six, I uh, want to bring up our notepad. There we go. And let me uh, add a page here and get to the right level so you can see what I'm seeing. And let's go ahead and put this in our notes because I want to make sure that we can do a box fill. There will probably only be one or two questions, but we surely don't want you missing these. If there's going to be six, uh, number 14, this will be the last question we work, and then we'll go and take a break now, okay? But uh, let's finish this one up. Six number 14 AUG conductors, okay? And then we also got eight number, uh, what was it now? Eight number 12 conductors, okay? And then we have three. Number 10, so those are the biggest wires there, okay? Now, uh, very easy to solve this, okay, guys? But we do need to know in our code book, so let's go ahead and go there in our code book and, uh, and, and make sure we got this thing because in our code book, uh, uh, there's, there's a table, um, 31416, table 31416. So let's, I'm going to highlight it in mine, table 31416. And if we go up there, uh, let me zoom out here, a little bit too crazy there. Uh, there's a little table. Okay, there they are. So th this is the table, the size of the actual box itself in dimensions, right? Uh, and w whether it be a four by one, three by two, you know, four by two or whatever. And now, and, and by the way, uh, now that we're there, we're there on table uh, 314, 16, I'd like for you to uh, put a round box around this set, around octagonal around or octagonal type um, with your highlighter just put a circle around this section um, because those are our round sizes round box sizes trade size uh, uh, sizes for round and then square put it put us a, a complete square around this section here if you could please okay and then over here on the devices put yourself a little rectangle nice and thin and tall rectangle because sometimes people get the wrong section they're not in the square section, uh, even though they're asked for square, and they get the number over here somewhere, and that's round. Or they're down here in the device, and they were asked for a round. Uh, so you got to make sure you're in the right section. This is device down here, square there, and round there. You just don't get those mixed up. Okay. Now this particular question was asking for the, uh, you know, the cubic inches uh, for all of the wires that we have here in this uh, on your notepad. Okay. So uh, if we're in the code book and we go down to this table down here, it gives us the volume. Now, the volume is very easy. Instead of inches squared, which is area, it's inches cubed, okay? And for a number 14, it's listed right there. It's a 2, okay? So that's the first thing we need to write down, right, that it's a 2. And then uh, you can write that next to your 6, number 14, og. And then we have uh, 8, number 12s, and the number 12s are 2 and a quarter. Okay, so we'd want to write that two and a quarter next to our eight number 12s. And then lastly, we have three number 10s. So that's a multiplier of 2.5. So in your notes, uh, let's make sure we get that in there, okay? Uh, in your notes, uh, let's turn to our notepad together here. And we say, okay, then it wouldn't it be the math? Wouldn't it be six 
uh, let's just put it as a six, right? Six uh, times the size for number 14 og, uh, which is two. That we can do in our head, right? 12. Okay. And then we've got eight times the size for uh, 12 og, which we said was two and a quarter. Let's pull out the calculator for that one to make sure we get it right. Uh, 8 times 2.25 is 18. Okay, so uh, let's put 18 down there. Okay, and then we got 3 times the size for a 10 og, and for a 10 og we said it was 2.5, right? And you guys still got your code books open, so you can verify that. Okay, and that one we can do in our head, but let's pull up our calculator anyway, right? 2.5 times 3, and make sure we got that 7.5 down correctly, right? And then if we tally all this up, right, we got a 5 here. Uh, 2 and 8 is 10, 7, um, and carry a 1, and that's 37.5 inches cubed or cubic inches, okay? Once again, that's the volume, okay? Uh, requirement of the box minimum okay and so then we could simply go back to the table and we could size the box right if we were to just slide up we'd go we'd go up and we'd look at what were what box had 37 and none of the round ones have 37 uh this this square one right here has at least 37 that has 42 so the correct answer would be four and 11 sixteens by two and an eighth. That would be the first box that could actually fill it right there. It's 42 uh, cubic inches would, would fit our 37 and a half. And the correct box size square box would be a four and 11 sixteens by two and one eighth. Okay. So um, the rest of the workbook uh, is really uh, a lot of homework. And uh, I'll tell you that there, there, there is a couple of questions. Uh, let's see, I'm in the NEC here. What's what's the deal? Okay, uh, okay, okay. There it is. I, I apologize. Um, so the, the the rest of the workbook does have a lot of math. Uh, I would anticipate you being able to go over that on your own. Uh, converting percentages to decimals. We've been doing a lot of this stuff now. This stuff should be elementary or pretty 101. Uh, basic stuff, squaring, taking the square root. This is basic math. Electrical concept using Ohm's law. We've talked about this. And then, um, you know, solving for Ohm's law with the formulas. This one here, by the way, is a tough little formula. We'll see if we can't at least do one of those problems, and then we'll close this session out, okay? Um, but solving for current, solving for voltage, solving for power, all these are required on the state exam. You've got to be able to do this. If you don't understand this math, uh, something's wrong. You're not ready to take the test. You've got to go through this math. Make sure you're good to go. Circuit analysis, series circuits. There's a series circuit right there. A 3-ohm uh, resistive uh, device in series with a 6-ohm. And then I think we've got a parallel one here. And you see the math on solving uh, using the equations, you should be able to do this, right? The equations are shown there. So make sure that you're able to follow all of these examples for series and parallel circuits, okay? Very good examples, solving for ohms, volts, amps, and kilowatts, okay? Um, you should be able to do this, okay? Uh, if not, you really should call in, speak to an engineer, get you to help you out, okay? Now, supplemental electrical questions, a lot of these are pretty easy. What's the KW? of a 75 watt load, okay? And you're like, uh, well, wouldn't it be this one here? So we, we uh, when you when when you circle your answer and you take this little test, uh, at the at the at the end of the at the end of the exam, we hear after question number 36 is your answer key, okay? Question number D, so I guess I got that first one right. And here's your answer key down here uh, and there it answers all 36 of them, okay? Now uh, here's some more software techniques, okay? Uh, but at the at the last page of your of your workbook, uh, but some of these are a little bit harder, okay? Uh, you know the total resistance, the 12 ohms, a load is 10, the wire is two, 
if the circuit is 3 amps, then what's the part consumed by the conductors? Those are some pretty good little questions, right? They should challenge you a little bit, get you to think a little bit, and be able to calculate that answer. This is great homework, okay? Now, I'm going to show you one of them, okay? And I'm going to show you, because I told you you should highlight these now. Number 35, number 34, highlight both of those together. These all uh, require the same format. And then number 30, where is it now? Number 28. It's all on the same page. Okay, 28. Uh, 34 and 35. Those are all um, the same kind of question to see if you can't get the math. Okay. Uh, and so let's see if we can go ahead and, uh, and solve at least one of these together. And that way you have it. Okay. But this is a pretty good one right here. Let's go with this one together. And then you can, we'll go with 28. And see if you can solve 34 and 35 on your own. Okay. But in this case, we got a 10 kW heat strip rated 240, but we only connect it to 208. Well, that's a bit of a problem, okay? If this is our formula, if this is our question, what's the power of a 10 kW heat strip rated at 240, but you connect it to 208? Well, that happened to me one time where I had to do that, and I had to calculate, and I wasn't happy <laughs> with my answer because, you know, a 10 kW heat strip rated 240 should be connected to what? 240, right? You connect it to 28, and well, you're going to have a problem, okay? If you connect it to 120, you might say you have half the power. Well, that would be wrong, okay? If you connect a 10 kW heat strip that's supposed to be rated 240 to 120, it's not half the power. Um, in this case, it's not a percentage of 28 either. You have to use Ohm's law, okay? So, what Ohm's law formula is it? Well, if you go to the beginning of the book, right, page six, the first thing you need to do is calculate the resistance. The resistance right here says that E squared over P gives you the resistance. E squared over P, that's formula number one. E squared over P gives you the resistance, okay? So going back to the question, uh, number 28 here, if it's 10 kW heat strip rated at 240, what is the resistance? Well, I always like to put it in, um, you know, on a, uh, on a diagram because if it's on a diagram, I, I understand it better, okay? But if we're starting out with 240 and it's 10 kW heat strip and going down to 208, it, there, you have to use Ohm's law to solve it. So let's go ahead and get our notepad out here and let's go ahead and start another page and this will be the last question uh, for the afternoon, okay? Um, and then we're gonna do some sample testing and some other fun stuff here in the class. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw the circuit here. I had a 240 volt scenario, right? And I have a heat strip that's supposed to give me 10,000 watts, but it's not because I have only 208 available, but it's the same load, okay? So that's a problem. Okay, now the the interesting thing is that this resistor on this side is the same as this resistor on this side. They're, they're the same resistor regardless what voltage you hook it to, right? Whether you have 240 or whether you have 28, right? That That's the change. That's the only change in the question, okay? Well, if that's the only thing that's different, the resistor doesn't change, okay? So what is the resistance? Well, we just looked at the formula E squared divided by... Uh, P, right? So wouldn't it be 240 times 240 divided by uh, 10,000 to get the resistance? Sure. We've done Ohm's Law a bunch in this class, right? A bunch. This one's just a little bit weird uh, because of the application. 240 times 240 divided by 10,000 is 5.76. 5.76. So let me just close this. So if this is 5.76 ohms, isn't this also 5.76 ohms? Well, sure it is. Okay. Now, if we know Ohm's law, once again, and we're trying to solve for the new power out, since we know the resistance, and the question is, what new wattage am I going to get out of here? Right? That's now the new question. Power is equal to what? Well, 
once again, this formula wheels are pretty important, you guys. You got to have them. You know, where do you pull it out in your in your uh, in your out of your out of your hat? You know, out of your bill uh, of your ball cap? I mean, where you know where do we get this stuff? Uh, in in this case, for the lecture purposes, it's on page six, right? Where you get on the test? Well, it's a good question because um, some in some uh, testing agencies they actually give it to you. In some states, it's on the Uglies book cover page, and that's great. But you need this, this some these these various forms. As a matter of fact, just in in terms of review, remember that this is your primary form of par is equal to i squared times r, and i is equal to p over e. That one's those two. I guarantee you, definitely i is equal to p over e is on the exam big time, big time. Right, so if you got a tattoo, this thing on your arm, you get yourself a tattoo, okay? Um, but power, in this case, this is the formula we need in this case, which is a very unique question, okay? Don't get me wrong, this is a very, very unique case where we're solving for resistance first, given formula number one, and then we're solving for power, given formula number twelve. This is kind of a weird one, okay? But it's in the workbook. I don't want to leave you all hanging and and uh, not be able to answer the questions in the workbook and say, whoa, sure, I couldn't figure it out. And then, you know, you, you're stumped. I don't want anyone stumped. This is a stumper type question, and it's in there. So I want to make sure I address it. Solving for resistance first using the voltage and the power, right? So it would be 240 squared. 240 times 240 divided by the 10,000 gave me that resistance of uh, 5.76. Then I'm going to solve for the new power given the new voltage and the known resistance of the heating element, okay? The new voltage is 28, right? So in our notes, nope. In our notes here, wouldn't it be, let's go ahead and put our formula down, E squared divided by R. Our new voltage is here, right? So wouldn't it be 28 times 28 divided by the resistance, which is over here, okay? And that's 5.76, right? These are volts, these are ohms, right? And let's calculate this thing and wrap this thing up. 28 <clears throat> times 28, which is a new voltage, divided, and that comes out to be a weird number, that's fine, divided by 5.76 ohms, and we get 7,511 watts. So there's really no other way to do this one except using Ohm's law, okay? So let's see if we got it right. Uh, boy, where are we at here? We're in the workbook. Let's slide on down. We were doing question number 20. Uh, where are we at here? Question number 28 is the one we're doing there. And so the correct answer we came up with was 7,500, right? So wouldn't the correct answer be 7.6 kW? Okay. So uh, once again, uh, the workbook uh, works together with uh, the lecture. Okay, that we went over. Uh, so let me just review that. This workbook that we just concluded. I know it took a you know a little over an hour here, uh, but it's very very important that this workbook be understood. Um, most of it is pretty 101-ish, okay? Pretty easy stuff, but there's a few stumpers in there, and uh, there's, they're, they're meant to be so, so that you could actually think and study, okay? We need for you to work out here to get in shape for this uh, upcoming examination. But that workbook, uh, in parallel with all the notes that we took, uh, with the studying of your code book, and the electoral lecture that we did earlier, which was this one here, and had this entire outline uh, and all these details here, but this seminar outline and the seminar that you've went through, uh, the workbook that we've gone through, and very, very importantly, the software. If you can go through all the software and turn on the uh, turn on all these green lights, gentlemen, then we consider you to be ready to take this uh, state examination. We encourage you to do so as soon as possible. So once again, if you need to contact us, uh, you can definitely do so with the contact information given here. Um, in this particular document, uh, oh, one other thing to mention here, share your licensing success with your friends uh, with Prep at Home. A lot of guys have a lot of fear regarding this exam. It's really not that hard if you do your studying, okay? 
refer your friends, forward the text. Maybe you guys got some text in your, in your phones. You got business cards, pass them out, okay? Uh, if you get some flyers from us or business cards, uh, pin them up in your, uh, p p pin up these postcards and, and uh, business cards on the billboards at your local supply houses. That's where a lot of guys talk and a lot of guys uh, will get our information, okay? Uh, but once again, I uh, sure appreciate you coming to Prep at Home, the Contractor School, and uh, going through this seminar. I think it's been uh, pretty thorough and will help you uh, pass the state examination. And uh, if you need to contact us, so I can blow this up a little bit here, um, there is some of our phone numbers. Uh, so feel, uh, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm going to go ahead and leave it on this page. Make sure you get down anyone's phone number that you might need. My name is Julian, and I look forward to a, an upcoming seminar with you shortly. Uh, or we can get on a webinar, our webinars and our seminars uh, for our alumni and for our students uh, are free if you come back for a review uh, currently. So uh, we look forward to uh, hearing your success story and your testimonial. So if you call, call our cell phone and you don't get us, please leave us a voicemail on your success. Uh, what you got on your grade and uh, the city you took it in, the test you took it in, all that's really, really cool uh, to hear all your testimonials. And um, feel free to share information uh, and share your success with your friends so that we can get other guys to pass this thing and do better for their lives and for their families, okay? So we thank you all for uh, coming to Prep at Home, the Contractor School, and we'll see you for the next session. Thanks for your time.